Good morning and welcome to First Coleraine. If you're visiting us, you are very, very welcome. Let's worship God together. God calls us to worship him with these words from Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We're going to respond to God's call and we're going to sing together this old hymn, Lead Kindly Light. It's a very old hymn that was written by John uh, Henry Newman way back in 1833. In 1833, he found himself on a ship from Palermo in Italy to Marseille in France. He had been suffering from a, a fever that he couldn't get rid of. He thought he was going to die. And in the midst of the sea, the, the ship was becalmed, it was going nowhere, and he thought, I'm never going to get home to England. And he sat down on the ship and he wrote this amazing hymn. And it has been a real blessing to people right throughout the centuries. In a, in a, in a mine in uh, Durham, there were 34 miners trapped uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. They found a little vein called the Tilly vein, and there the 34 of them sat. And as they were sitting, waiting, hoping that they might be rescued, one of them started to sing, Lead Kindly Light. On her way from uh, her home where the SS troops had picked her up, uh, Betsy Tenboom, Corrie Tenboom's sister, on the way to the, the Nazi concentration camp at Ravensbrück, on the train, she and a few other children began to sing, Lead Kindly Light. Let's stand and praise God together. Of course, all our praise this morning is directing us to God's word and to the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning. Let's pray together. 
Heavenly Father, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Your righteousness is our rock. Your love is our liberty. And your sovereignty is our sanity. You reign over all. All things. In all times. In all places. And all your ways are good. And so the events of the past week have driven us yet again to bring our frustrations to you, to fix our gaze on you, and to put our trust in you. Your word is true. There is only one government and one peace that is sufficient to meet the needs of our sinful hearts, to meet the needs of our divided country, and to meet the needs of this restless world. Our only hope is that you are ruling the world with truth and grace. Father, will you make this truth more real to us than ever? You are working all things together after the counsel of your will. You are the Lamb of God, the Lord of Lords, and the lamp of the new Jerusalem. You are working in all things for your glory and for our good. And we praise you, for no one and nothing can derail, deter, or distract you from bringing to completion your good work of redemption and restoration. We praise you, O Lord, for your peace will prevail, not just over our current crazy world, but over all sin, over all brokenness, over all evil over all of our self-serving ways. Forgive us, Father, for we often get impatient with your timing. Often we don't like all of your providences. Often we second-guess your purposes. Please allow the good news of the gospel to do its transforming work in our lives. May it grow to produce the fruit that you have desired. Free us, Father, to serve joyfully, to love boldly, to pray unceasingly, and to hope patiently. For you will one day finish making all things new. In Jesus' merciful name we pray. Amen. Let's sing uh, another hymn together. This, this is not old, old, but it's old if you consider the 1980s old, as some of us do. Melody Green uh, sat down and wrote a wonderful hymn called There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's Own Son. She wrote the first two verses of it, and she took it into her husband, Keith Green, the great uh, musician and songwriter, to see what he thought. And he wrote the very last verse. He says, it's not finished. So he sat down and wrote the last verse. When I stand in glory, I will see his face. Only a little while later, he was killed in a plane crash with his son, Josiah. Let's stand and sing, There is a Redeemer.
Let's turn to God's Word and to James chapter 4. If you're visiting with us, we have been journeying together through the letter of James here on Sunday mornings and on Wednesdays at our midweek. And we're going to come to James chapter 4 and verse 13 this morning. So Matthew's going to come and read this for us. Thank you, Matthew. Reading from James chapter 4 verse 13. Now listen you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. Matthew, thank you so much indeed. And keep your finger in that passage, uh, and we'll come back to it in a moment or two. But boys and girls, would you like to come down to the front, because I'd like to come down and talk to you for a moment. But I want to show you something this morning. I didn't, don't know whether you've seen this box before. Have you seen this box before, anybody? Does anybody know what this box is? Yep. Uh, law, that's what it is. It says on it, lost property. What do you think is in the lost property box? Things that people have lost. And uh, it's amazing what people have lost in our church. This, uh, this has been gathering up for a few weeks now. And uh, well, this, somebody's lost their Bible. You know the way they've been saying, oh yes, I read my Bible every day. Well, you don't. Because it's here. Okay? It's here. Right? Somebody's lost their Bible. Okay? And an umbrella. Somebody's lost an umbrella. Lovely I think it's a lady's umbrella because there's lovely purple, uh, pink, pinky purple on it. Anybody lost an umbrella? You're not going to, yes. <laughs> we'll come and get it at the end. And one, two, three, four, five, six, six coats, fleeces, jumpers. How do you lose your coat? This is, you know, how do you do that? You, you know it's either going to be raining, it's raining, or it's going to be raining. Yeah. So, come and get your coat afterwards. Lovely bag. Lost a bag. Lost another bag. Lost your glasses. How? How do you? I mean, what have you been doing? I don't know if any of these would, any of these suit me, do you think? For that? No? No. What about these ones? Those ones? Yes. yes. You like those ones? Okay. What about these? Oh, these are nice. I like these. Those ones there? No? Glasses. Loads of glasses. A hundred million glasses. Cases. More umbrellas. Hats. More umbrellas. More gloves. More glasses. Unbelievable. The folks around here must be blind. <laughs> Sunglasses. Sunglasses. Unbelievable. Loads of... Uh, somebody's phone's not, sh not charged. Somebody's not able to play table tennis. Let's see what else we have here. Somebody's not writing. Um, let's see... Lotus, uh, somebody's lost a belt. <laughs> somebody's hairband. Folks, 
Let's come and pick it up. And if it's not yours, I'm taking the glasses because I think they suit me. Okay? If, you, if they're not picked up by the end of the day or by this week, they're all going to someone who would appreciate them or someone who needs them. So please do come and get your lost property. Have you lost anything? Any of those coats? Is your coat there? Oh, the charger's yours. Is it? Is that charger yours? Well, look. We shall return it. Oh. I've lost part of it. But you can come and get it afterwards, okay? Do you know where it is now? It's in the lost property box. That's where it is. We all... Who hasn't lost something? Who has never lost anything? Anything? I remember being lost one time. I remember I was out with my mum... And we were in a shop, and my mum had said to me, James, you stay right there, I'm just going to get this. And I decided I wasn't going to stay right there, I would just wander off. And very quickly I discovered, where's mum? Oh, that, that was real panic, that real, I didn't know where she was. And do you know what, I cried, I cried, and it was when I was crying that my mum found me. Losing things is not a very nice thing. We, we, can, we can lose things because we just, we set them down and we forget that we've set them down. I, I'm constantly losing stuff at home, keys and glasses and uh, jumpers and shoes and socks and all kinds of things I lose. The Bible says this, if you trust him, he will never lose you. He will never lose you. Here's what he says, I will never leave you and never forsake you. He'll never lose you. Wow. is that a wonderful promise? No matter where we go, no matter what we do, God's always going to be with us. He can't lose you. Never, ever. What a wonderful, wonderful promise. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are such a wonderful friend. That you promise that when we put our trust in you, you will never leave us. Never forsake us. Always be with us. Father, forgive us for the many times we forget you. And forget that you're with us. And forget that you love us. And forget that you care for us. But thank you that you never, ever forget us or lose us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Boys and girls, we're going to sing a song together that I used to sing when I was your age. And let me tell you, that's a long, long, long time ago. It's a beautiful, beautiful hymn, written by a man called Walter Math Matheson. And the only thing I can say about him is that he was asked to write this hymn. He was asked by the Baptist Union in Edinburgh to write a hymn for children. And even though he was a Baptist, we're going to sing it this morning. We'll forgive him for that because it's such a wonderful, wonderful hymn. It, the first line of it goes, Jesus, friend of little children. You know what? Let's stand and sing.
we're going to turn to James chapter 4, and we're going to study from verse 13, so it might be helpful to have that open it in front of you this morning as we study it together. That's a lovely hymn, isn't it? What a, what a blast from the past, what a great reminder that God is with us and for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are indeed our friend. And we thank you for your presence with us this morning. Lord, we need you more than ever in our lives. And so we ask that you would speak to us now through your word. And by your word and by your spirit, change us for your glory's sake. Amen. All my friends have such massive bucket lists. Mine is just a little peel in comparison. A little peel, a little massive bucket, a little... Okay, okay. We all have plans, don't we? Some will fall into place, others perhaps not. In the book Swiss Family Robinson, the family, uh, if you know, remember that book, from A Blast from the Past, the family had just been shipwrecked on an island. And after a good night's sleep, the father took one of his sons to go and explore the island. And they got together their supplies ready uh, ready to go. And they were just about to set off to explore when the father says, Stop, I exclaimed. We have still left something very important undone. Surely not, said Fritz. Yes, said I. We have not yet joined in morning prayer. We are only too ready amid the cares and pleasures of this life to forget the God to whom we owe all things. And so, having remembered their neglect, they paused and turned their plans over to God. This next passage in James, uh, from verse 13, James is assuming that we believe that Jesus is the Lord of our lives. He's assuming that as Christians we believe that Jesus is Lord of our lives. But here's the problem that James is addressing. When it comes down to the business of daily living, we set aside what we believe and we function practically as if God didn't really exist. So we believe in our hearts and our heads, Jesus is Lord, but in the actual daily grind and the little things of life, the decisions that we take, we we believe as if he didn't. We make our daily plans, we set our life goals, and we go about accomplishing our dreams without even pausing to acknowledge him or to ask him for help or to look for what he's doing or to turn to his word for guidance. We sing like believers, but we behave like unbelievers. Did you notice when Matthew read the passage so well for us, so wonderfully for us, that did you notice that twice James says here in verse 13 of chapter 4 and in verse 1 of chapter 5, did you notice what he says? He says it twice. He says, now listen. Now listen. Do you notice that? Verse 13 of chapter 4 and verse 1 of chapter 5. Now listen. He repeats himself. Janice said to me the other day, James, you haven't listened to one word that I've said, have you? And I thought, that's a very strange way to start a conversation. (laughs) James is continuing the same idea as he's been uh, talking about in, in the last chapters. Do you remember how he talked about worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. He talked about selfishness and self-centeredness and he talked about seeking God and then he talked about the end result of both of those ways. Do you remember that? Well, he's doing the same here. He does the same here with our plans and with our pounds. Do you see what he's saying in verse 13? James wrote, now listen You who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Now be careful. Be careful. James isn't saying, don't make plans. 
In fact, if you are an organized sort of person, uh, you will really love what James is saying here because he suggests a very good pattern for making plans. Remember, he's writing to these people who have been persecuted in Jerusalem, Christians persecuted in Jerusalem and scattered uh, away from Jerusalem, and they're having to pick up the pieces of life and begin new life and begin new business and set up their lives again else in some uh, different and foreign place. And so he's writing to them, and it's a time of crisis. So here's a good way to begin uh, or to plan Do you you see, first of all, he says, get a start date. If you're planning anything, sort out a start date. He says, today or tomorrow. A plan of any kind needs a a start date. Get out your calendar, put a a ring round, a date in the calendar, and that's that's your start date. We we start that day, uh, today, or we start tomorrow. Procrastination is my sin. It brings me naught but sorrow. I know that I should stop it. In fact, I will tomorrow. (laughs) So the first thing is get a start date. That's a good start to the plan. Secondly, do you see see James says, we will go to such and such a city. You don't just have a start date. You have a start location. Where are you going to do this? Where? So when you invite me for coffee this week, uh, you need to tell me when, and you need to tell me where, and you need to bring your wallet. Um, thirdly, how long will it take, James, said. James says, they, they would spend a year there. How long is this going to take? A start date, a start location, and a length of time. They don't plan to live where they're going. They just plan to do business there, to spend enough time to make enough profit. Fourthly, do you see, uh, what, what exactly what they, are they going to do? Well, James says, they will buy and sell. That's what they're going to do on the date in the place where they're going in order to make a profit. That's how they're going to make their profit, buying and selling. Now, folks, that's a very wise structure. It's a very sensible plan. It's got the who, the what, the when, the where, and the how all laid out. The problem isn't in the plan. The problem is what's missing from the plan. That's the problem. Nowhere in any of the planning is there any acknowledgement of dependency upon God. It's a plan that for all intents and purposes is drawn up as if God doesn't exist or even if he does exist, he's not relevant to my plans. He's not involved. Remember, James is writing to Christians. But we behave like this, don't we? We say we believe one thing, but we behave like another. James is saying, you're making plans as if you're the one that's in control of everything. As if just because you plan it, that's it. That's the way it's going to happen. Now, listen He says, catch yourself on, we would say. Catch yourself on. Look at verse 14. You do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. When I read that, I thought of the parable that Jesus told in Luke chapter 12. You remember? And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he planned. He said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, eat drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you've prepared, whose will they be? So this is the one who lays up for himself treasure and is not rich toward God, Jesus says. It's called, we often call that the parable of the rich fool. By the way, His plan is an excellent plan from a supply and demand perspective. It's an excellent plan. He has a bumper crop. 
And his plan is, I'm not going to release all of this onto the market all at once. Because if I release it onto the market all at once, the price will drop and I'll not get a great return for my effort. He says, I'm going to build bigger barns. This is what you would do. You would build bigger barns. You would store up the crop and you would release it onto the market slowly. Thus keeping the prices high. It's it's an excellent plan. He laid up for himself excellently everything except dependency dependency on the God who is in control and who is sovereign over all things. And that night he lost everything. Psalm 90 says, Our days are like a dream, like the grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and grows, in the evening it fades and withers. So in the the light of the uncertainty of life, what, what should we do? What should we do? Stop making plans and go with the flow? Just become passive and indifferent? No, no, James says, we should make plans, good plans. But James says, remember who is in control. Verse 15, look, he says, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. I really love what the way James puts this. It's not just if the Lord wills. He says, if I live, if I live. Because none of us know what this day is going to bring. If I live for another day, if God gives me breath for another day, then perhaps I'll do this or that if he wills. The, the Apostle Paul was always doing that. He was a very busy man. He was always on the move, always planning the next mission trip, always planning the next city that he was going to. But he was constantly saying, as he did in Acts 18, to the Christians at Ephesus, I'm going to Jerusalem, but I will return to you again. God willing. DV, God willing. Now, folks, it's not just about saying God willing after everything that we plan to do. It's not like saying, you know, oh, I'll meet you for coffee this, this week, God willing. It's not about just saying, I'm going to, going to go to uh, Belfast this week, God willing. It's not just about saying that. Although, that's a very good thing to get into the habit of saying because it reminds us of this truth that James is trying to teach us. It's more than that. It's about consciously and deliberately submitting our plans to the only one who has complete control of everything and for whom everything is ordered. It's about not just making our plans, but actually looking for what God is doing, what what God is saying, what doors God is opening and stepping through those doors. Let's, of course, make our plans but let's do it as in the writer of proverbs reminds us and remember the promise that he gave to us trust in the lord with all your heart lean not on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths if we don't james says What's the end of that? Well, then we're left with, as James has been telling us right throughout this letter, all that we're left with is ourselves. Trusting and depending on ourselves. You you hear it all the time today. It's, it's, It's almost become like a mantra for every film that's on TV, every documentary, every drama. You hear these words, you can be anything you want to be. You can achieve anything that you want if you just set your mind to it. You hear these wonderful sportsmen who have achieved something, sportswomen who have won a gold medal in the Olympics and they're interviewed and they say, what would you like to say? I can say to every boy and girl, you can be what you want to be. Really? Really? James says, all of that is just making empty boasts. Bragging about how we don't really need God. And James says, all such boasting is evil. It is selfish and it is self-centered. 
And just like the worldly wisdom we heard about in chapter 3, and just like the selfish coveting we heard about in chapter 4, that selfish boasting leads only one way. And that's what he's going to tell us in chapter 5. Look in verse, chapter 5 and verse 1. Now, listen, you rich people, he says. Listen. Now, again, don't get James wrong. He's not saying that being rich is wrong any more than making plans is wrong. Being rich isn't the problem. What James is saying in in chapter 5 and verse 1, he's saying, you folks, you folks who have made the who, the what, the, the when, the where, the how, the why plans, but you've ignored God. James says, you think that because you've made a few bags of coins, that now that you've bought yourself a nice frock, that you're safe, that you've made it, that you can sit back and put your feet up and ignore God. He says, look, just look at what you've done. Just look at what you've become. You sit there and you put your feet up and you look down your nose at others And it only goes one way, James says, this kind of selfish, ignoring God, doing your own thing. It only leads one way. You you look down your nose at others. You treat them like they aren't even human, like they aren't made in the image of God. And because you've ignored them, you can ignore his image in them. And so they just become fodder for your feeding frenzy. And I could stand here all day And we could go over example upon example upon example where both at a government level, on a social level, on a church level, that that has become true. When we ignore God, then it only leads to selfishness and the abuse of others. It only goes one way. It's what happens when we leave God out. We forget or we don't want to see or admit that all that we have accumulated will rust and rot and turn to rubble. Folks, we're all going to leave it behind one day. John Ortberg wrote a great book uh, a number of years ago uh, called It All Goes Back in the Box. And he begins by telling a story about Christmas and uh, those family get-togethers and his family used to love playing board games. And I don't know what his family was like, but when board games were brought out in our house, it was war. War. So much energy, so much passion, so much cheating (laughs) went on in those board games. Uh, and all of that, and the fights, and the fallouts, and the door slamming, and the, all of that went on. And then at the end of the night, you pack up the pieces, and it all goes back in the box. And John Ortberg's kind of end of the, the whole story is, yeah, it's just like life, isn't it? We all go back in the box. We're all going to leave it behind. And those in-laws, they're going to become outlaws one day. But what of us? What, what, what if we've made that our end? If we've ignored God in life? What are we going to say to him on that day? I don't know if you have a bucket list. Do you have a bucket list? No. A bucket list is a list of those things that you intend to do before you go back in the box. I looked up, there's a website, believe it or not, called bucketlist.net. And if you're struggling to find your bucket list, you might want to look it up. Here's the top 10 things that people have put in their bucket list. Number 10, to see the pyramids. Maybe just not at the moment. 
Number nine, to run a marathon. I'd rather eat one. <laughs> or a Snickers if you're too young. Number eight, buy a house. Number seven, scuba dive. Number six, get married. Only those who aren't married would even suggest that, you know. <laughs> Number five, swim with dolphins. Number four, go on a cruise. Number three, get a tattoo. <laughs> Seriously? <coughs> Number two, skydive. Not a chance. Number one, to see the northern lights. To see the northern lights. Well, I hope this morning that James has helped us to see the light, not the northern lights, but the true light, who gives light to every man, as we're going to read very shortly at Christmas. I said to the Kirk session, uh, the reason that I wanted to go back on sabbatical back in uh, September was that I have a, if God spares, if the Lord wills, I have a few years left in ministry and I want to finish well. So I went off on sabbatical to think about what that means. What it doesn't mean is that I can plan and prepare for the future um, and know what lies ahead because I don't. None of us know what today or tomorrow or the next day is going to bring. I have no control for good or ill for what lies ahead. But there's one verse that has been ringing in my ears since that sabbatical, and it's Paul's words in Colossians 3 and 17. It says this, And whatever you do, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let it be so. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in the world around us today, we see the results of those who have not thought of you, have not considered you, don't realize that one day they'll stand before you. And we see the resultant greed and selfishness and violence and hardship and hurt and pain and anguish that all of that causes. Father, forgive us. Father, forgive us. We pray that in your mercy, you would give time for people to respond in repentance and in faith to you. And in doing so, Lord, to bring about change. We long for change on our island, Lord, and in our wee nation. Lord, we long that men, women, and children would see their need of you, see their need and understand, O oh Lord, that at the end of the day, it all goes back in the box. And all of the things that we have placed our hope in and our confidence in and that we thought, O oh Lord, would bring hope and satisfaction, O oh Lord, just cannot fulfill. Only you can. Father, forgive us in our individual lives when we we sing like believers, but behave like unbelievers. Go with us this day, Lord. And in all that we do, whether in word or deed, help us to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, acknowledging that our lives are in your hand every moment, every day. Thank you that you do not leave us and you do not forsake us. Thank you that when we do that, you give life and life in all of its fullness. You created us to serve, and there is great joy in serving and in looking to you, and to know that what we do here and now is not just for here and now, but has eternal significance. Thank you, Father. We want to bring to you, O oh Lord, those today who know pain and anguish and sorrow. Those, O oh Lord, in hospital today. Those who have uh, uh, planned treatments ahead this week. 
Those, O oh Lord, who do not know what the next weeks or months will bring because of a diagnosis that they have received, we pray, O oh Lord, that in your mercy, if it is your will, that you would heal and restore. But even if it is not your will, Lord, that we would be tr drawn closer to you, moment by moment and day by day, and know that peace that only you can give. Because we have a future and we have a home. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn again is a lovely hymn, O oh, Love That Will Not Let Me Go. Uh, it's a wonderful hymn that was written in the 19th uh, century, the end of the 19th century, uh, by um, a guy called Madison. He had uh, been just to, he was uh, in his 20s, he was 20 years old, and he had just discovered that he was going blind. He was engaged to a girl, but he was told that he was going blind. And when he told his fiancée that he was going blind, she said, I don't really want to be married to a blind man. I don't want the burden of that. And so she left him. And for another 20 years, his sister looked after him and cared for him. But of course, eventually, she found a, a fiancé and uh, she was going to get married. On the eve of that wedding, the weight of everything came in on his heart and he was just torn with grief. He had lost his fiancé. Now he was losing his sister uh, in marriage and he was wondering what, what the future was going to hold with him. And he sat down and in five minutes, he says, he wrote this hymn five minutes and he said it's the only hymn I ever wrote that never needed any editing. Let's stand and sing O oh Love That Will Not Let Me Go. <laughs>
may the grace of the Lord Christ Jesus and the love of the Father above and the presence and the power of the Spirit of God go with us this day and forevermore. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.